as we prepare for St. Patrick's Day. I wonder, who was this person? There's much debate. The person who was to become St. Patrick, patron saint of Ireland, was born in Wales about A.D. 385. His given name was Mywin, and he almost didn't get the job of Bishop of Ireland because he lacked the required scholarship. Far from being a saint, until he was 16, he considered himself a pagan. At that age, he was sold into slavery by a group of Irish marauders that raided his village. And during his captivity, he became acquainted with Christianity. He escaped from slavery after six years and went to Gaul, where he studied in the monastery under St. Germain for 12 years. And during his training, he became aware that his calling was to convert the pagans to Christianity. His wishes were to return to Ireland. But his superiors instead appointed St. Pilatus. But two years later, Pilatus transferred to Scotland, and Patrick, having adopted that Christian name, was appointed the second bishop to Ireland. And he was quite successful at winning converts. And this fact upset the Celtic Druids, and he was arrested several times, but escaped each time. And he traveled through Ireland, establishing monasteries across the country. He also set up schools and churches that would aid him in the conversion of the Irish country to Christianity. His mission lasted about 30 years. At that time, he retired to County Down, and he died on March 17th, A.D. 461, and that day has been commemorated as his day. Much folklore surrounds St. Patrick's Day, and not much of it is actually substantiated. Some of the story includes the belief that Patrick raised people from the dead, and he's also said to have given a sermon that drove all the snakes from Ireland. And though originally a Catholic holy day, St. Patrick's Day has evolved into more of a secular holiday. A traditional icon is our shamrock. And this stems from an Irish tale that tells how Patrick used the three-leaf shamrock to explain the Trinity. He used it to rep in sermons to represent how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit could all exist as separate elements of the same entity. And his followers adapted the custom and are wear his shamrock on his feast day. Now, the St. Patrick's Day custom came to America in 1737. That was the first year St. Patrick's Day was publicly celebrated in this country and, of course, in Boston, probably South Boston. <laughs> Thomas Cahill, in How the Irish Saved Civilization, a delightful book, relates how unique St. Patrick's mission was. He went out to the countryside to meet the people. Ireland had largely been ignored by Christianity, for it had no central cities. St. Paul, in contrast, was a missionary to the cities and the urban areas around the Greek world. In the fourth century, Christianity was endorsed by Rome and became the official religion of the far-flung posts. In the fifth century, when Patrick lived, the Roman cities were being overrun by barbarians, and Patrick took the literature to Ireland. And he took not only Christian literature, but Roman literature and records of the Greek philosophers. While much of this heritage was being destroyed on the continent of Europe, Patrick was establishing these monasteries. And much of the classical literature that we have today 
is the result of that nobody thought Ireland was important enough to invade. <laughs> Because he had been a slave, he, he preached against slavery. And within his lifetime, or soon after his death, the Irish slave trade came to a halt. Although Patrick was a Roman citizen by birth, his Christianity had a distinctive Irish voice. Rather than the Roman style of Christianity most associated with St. Augustine. Augustine was a Neoplatonist who felt that the spirit was pure, but creation and the flesh were weak. Patrick was more connected to the earth. Listen to this prayer attributed to him. I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of sun, radiance of moon, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of sea, stability of earth, firmness of rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guide me. I arise today through the mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in threeness, through the confession of oneness, of the creator, of creation. There's several things that I hear in this prayer. The first is a reverence for the earth. The strength of creation is what helps him arise. Secondly, I hear that merging with God, the sense of the Spirit of God to speak and hear through him. And thirdly, the reverence to God as creator of the creation. The earth has a holiness because it is from God. Whether or not St. Patrick ever used the shamrock to explain the Trinity, you can see how he might have used nature as a way to explain the nature of God. In another prayer he wrote, I see his face in every flower. The thunder and the singing of the birds are but his voice and are carven by his power. Rocks are his written word. Much similar to Unitarian Emerson, who said, Scripture is nature, nature is Scripture written large. Thomas Cahill writes, This sense of the world as holy, as the book of God, as a healing mystery, fraught with divine messages, could never have arisen out of the Greco Roman civilization and their Platonic suspicions of the body as unholy and the world devoid of meaning. Another distinction between Patrick and the Roman church is that he allowed women in the monasteries, most notably Bridget, the high abbess of Kildare. This woman was a convert of St. Patrick's, and this is where the pagan legends and the Christian legends intertwine. The date of her death is celebrated in February, the same day as the Feast of Irish Fertility of the Goddess of the Same Name. St. Bridget, if she existed, may have been a priestess of this goddess before her conversion. It was said she was able to feed the animals without reducing the available food for people. And St. Patrick is in this way, also responsible for our knowledge of the Celtic religions. For he was about educating the monks, and the monks that he trained to read and write also wrote down the Irish tales for the first time. This respect for the folklore of the people, while at the same time converting him, is one of the most successful Christian evangelical tools. 
as the Irish monks spread their learning across Europe in the sixth and seventh century, this Christian of reinterpretation of pagan forms continued. So if you are a follower of Greek philosophy, Irish paganism, or Christianity, you owe much to the monks of Saint, that followed St. Patrick. They've wrote down these stories and preserved them while the rest of Europe was at war. However, the picture may be even more unclear. Barbara Walker, in the Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, suggests that St. Patrick may have been a fictional creation of the monks, who wanted to indicate that Ireland was Christianized much earlier than it was. And the shamrock had long been a symbol of the pagan triple deity. The Romans celebrated a festival during the Ides of March, March 15th, for Liber Pater, or the father of drink, or Bacchus, wine. So alcohol has long been associated with St. Patrick's Day. And the Pater, it might be from where St. Patrick gets his name. This mixture of paganism and Christianity made some Christians suspicious of the three-leaf clover and suggested that it was the four-leaf clover, which was in the shape of a cross, which was luckier. It's hard. It's hard in our modern world to decipher this blending of traditions. The, co the conversion of these various beliefs often results in something quite different from the original. And St. Patrick's Day in Ireland was and is still primarily a religious holiday. But after the Irish immigrated to America, it took on the cultural importance of pride and the wearing of green was a way of expressing solidarity with each other. And their festivals became so boisterous that even the non-Irish wanted to join. It's said that everybody is Irish on St. Patrick's Day. And we're seeing something similar in the, our country that people are becoming Spanish on Cinco de Mayo. Because <laughs> it just seems so much more fun. <laughs> in Chicago, the first mayor daily, a proud Irishman, started dyeing the Chicago River green. But he also, being the consummate politician he was, made sure that Columbus Day was declared a holiday for celebrating Italian Americans. And Chicago also, you get school days off for Pulaski Day to celebrate the Polish immigrant population, celebrating a revolutionary general. So March. 17th became a holiday for many reasons. But what kind of a holiday or holy day is it? Is it a political national holiday? Is it an immigrant's holiday? Is it a Christian holiday? Is it a pagan fertility fest? Is it a secular excuse to drink beer? <laughs> <laughs> It is all of these things, elusive and hard to capture, like a leprechaun, the leprechaun, the trickster, a promise of a pot of gold and after a rainbow, it is much like other pagan gods like Pan or Loki or even the Christian devil, especially Scratch, who was willing to sell your, your soul for those riches but it has connection to the Green Man and Peter Pan and Robin Hood. All these figures of mythology that were willing to relieve you of your possessions. <laughs> and they also represent living in harmony with nature, putting on the green, the way to unify with nature. To move away from those false goals, these leprechaun stories 
are always a warning against chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And instead, learning the lessons and enjoying the riches of nature itself. Ireland, with its rocky shores and green meadows, is a symbol of nature. Its history is mixed with myth and fact. It preserved history because it was once forgotten, preserving myth to fire our imagination. It tells us the need to tell stories, a bit to the Blarney. It keeps us connected to who we are, and these stories strangely unites us with people all over the world. I called an old friend last night, a wild high school buddy, and we remembered stories and he said that his wife wondered if I really existed and if these stories were any way true. My son got a chance to talk with him because this man was only a character in some of the wilder stories of my youth that I hesitate to tell this congregation. <laughs> and we tell these stories that contain the truth but also shape the truth and shade the truth until what we remember is actually more important than what may have happened. <laughs> the Irish saved these stories of Europe, and these stories inform us. And this St. Patrick's Day, let us participate in the sacred sacrament of Blarney. <laughs> let us tell our stories. Let us enjoy our stories. Let us share our stories and create new ones. May we bless and be blessed. Please join with me in the singing of our hymn number 143.